Professor Stone is Professor of Global Policy at the European University Institute in Florence. Uh, before that, she was for many years at the University of Warwick. She also worked at the end of the 90s uh, at the World Bank Institute. She had two spells at the Central European University, one during normal times and uh, uh, the second one during more, uh, um, you know, the, during the time when they were translating to, uh, sorry, they were uh, leaving um, Budapest and going to Vienna. Uh, she helped to create the International Public Policy Association, and she also served as vice president of the association. She was editor of uh, Global Governance and consulting, consulting editor of Policy and Politics. Um, in terms of her research, everything, everything she has written about is obviously very, very relevant for our new masters. Uh, so it's... it's uh, well, it's covered many aspects of what we hope to be teaching here, but it's, uh, a lot of it has to do with the politics of ideas, uh, either in terms of how think tanks uh, affect policy, public policies or the way ideas travel across national borders. So she has worked uh, on, yeah, on the, how think tanks may affect policies, how international organizations uh, have affected uh, policies in spe specific areas of the world, like Central and Eastern European countries, and of course on the dynamics of global policy making and policy translation. One thing uh, among the several uh, books and, and papers that I have read that I find particularly fascinating, and I hope it will influence us a lot here in our new masters, is the 2020 special issue uh, they published on how um, policy uh, transfer doesn't happen only from the center to the periphery, but also from peripheral countries to other peripheral countries, and sometimes even shock, shocking as it may sound, from the periphery to centra, more central countries. Today she will be talking to us about the roles and relevance of public policy schools and programs in the global order. So, um, Diane, thank you very much for being here today. Um, and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation and congratulations to everybody on the new master's program. I know how much work, team effort goes into building and sustaining these new degrees and uh, new initiatives. And I will talk today a little bit about um, uh, policy teaching and some of the themes that I've been experiencing um, at my new workplace, which I'll come to in a moment. But at this point, I'd like you to focus not on the, my name or position, um, but on the image of the globe sitting on top of the um, laptop keyboard. Um, because this is the first of three images of globes um, that I want to sort of depict as the theme of where I want us to go today. Uh, so this one of um, the jigsaw sort of represents global policy as a puzzle, but also in the sense of it being a series of interconnections of different shapes, um, sometimes difficult to put together because we, when we do jigsaws, we put them in the wrong space while we're trying to work out uh, what we're doing. And this is in um, distinction to the kind of natural world or the, the, the raw uh, globe image of the world um, and what I want to do is to talk about global policy making but also proceed to thinking about um, public policy as a field of study that um, is one where we engage in all sorts of uh, disciplinary trespasses and subversions. I won't um, talk too much about linked ecologies other than to use it as a metaphor uh, for some of the things that I think are happening to the broad field of public policy and to talk about how global policy approaches might contribute to the development of policy degrees um, in a decentered academic uh, world. So that's the raw image of um, the globe. What I 
want to do is to move away from this kind of image of the world, which is one that is very much cut up into national sovereign jurisdiction, a world of hard borders and international uh, system, uh, which is characterized in um, academic study um, as a form of what I've called and many others call uh, methodological transnational, sorry, methodological nationalism. Uh, the tendency to uh, look at um, nation states as a container um, and to look at public policy developments um, and a, an analysis of those developments in terms of what happens inside a nation state or a sovereign state that has ha hard uh, borders. So the state is the unit of analysis. And comparative public policy does not really transform um, that notion of the state as the unit of analysis. It is more about the comparison of one state with one or more other states as well. And when it comes to addressing globalization, it has meant, I think, looking at the impact of globalization on the state, inside the state, rather than looking at the development of flows um, and practices that move through the state, but also into different um, forms of practice and new kinds of institutional interactions. So one of the things that I think um, is interesting about global policy studies is that it makes uh, a move from uh, methodological nationalism, which I'm not saying is bad, okay? Methodological nationalism will stay with us. Um, but I think uh, what global policy approaches try to do is to get to um, ontological nationalism. It's a mouthful, okay? It's not a phrase I like, um, but it kind of is the next step on from methodological nationalism. I do actually prefer the phrase global mindset, a phrase or concept that comes out of business studies uh, that looks at the ways in which um, executives, uh, which can be public sector executives and not just necessarily those in the corporate sector, the ways in which uh, executives are encouraged to develop um, skill sets that are cross-cultural um, and open to um, different forms of engagements um, beyond a national context. Um, also, I think uh, another aspect of ontological transnationalism is about remaking the world with new concepts, new ideas uh, that interpret the, interpret the kinds of new policy practice that are emerging uh, in regional domains, transnational domains, micro-regions as well. So, um, policy, public policy is important in the sense that the kinds of stories that it tells through analysis are important uh, in remaking uh, the world and remaking understandings of different uh, dynamics. So it's not a static thing. It's something that is constantly in the process of making or in becoming, according to those who write in this particular uh, field. So there are a number of new terms that have emerged. Um, I wouldn't say they're competing, uh, but they're all trying to grasp at some aspect of the, the kinds of changes in policy making that occurs beyond the state. Um, I have in my past used the phrase global policy or global policy making. That is my fav favoured term. I have a colleague who I write with who's much more from a public administration background and she talks about transnational administration. Um, and I think also uh, looking at different disciplinary backgrounds, uh, the term trans transnationalism is probably more predominant in um, geography and sociology and anthropology, whereas the term global governance probably occurs a little more frequently in uh, international relations, IPE, uh, and development studies. 
But the reason why I put up this logo or this brand image of the School of uh, Transnational Governance, where I currently work, is that um, this term was one that was given to the new professors that arrived in uh, 2020 who were tasked to develop the new degree, um, a Master's in Transnational Governance. And of course, one of us said, what does it mean? Okay. Uh, so we have spent the past three years trying to imbue meaning into this phrase that the, the European Commission gave to us as our primary funder. Um, and it's a, it's a source of frustration, but it's also one of opportunity, I think. Um, and my colleagues would probably come up with some different um, definitions than the ones that I will uh, provide. Um, and the one that is used as a shorthand, certainly in our marketing, is that the Masters in Transnational Governance is about governance behind, behind the state, beyond the state. Okay. Um, we also felt that we needed to distinguish transnational governance uh, from global governance. And uh, one of the stories we tell here is that the idea of global governance has been much used over the past 30 years. It has become a bit of an empty signifier. Um, it, some um, schools of the thought about global governance posited at the turn of the millennium that the state might wither away. And that certainly has not happened. So for us, transnational governance is a term that also embodies the word national. And the nation state is something that remains very central um, to, to governance. So it's a phrase that we're using. Uh, I don't think we've fully developed um, what it means but it's something that we have to do because our graduates need to explain to their future employers what their degree in transnational governance means, how it better positions them in um, their future careers and in relation um, to um, other degrees. So here I have one of my attempts to define um, transnational governance. Um, I'm not happy with it yet. I've certainly not published it. This is its first airing. Um, it's just too long-winded for my liking. Um, and I'll come to another definition in a moment that I think does it better than this one. But uh, uh, just picking out three aspects of it, um, the notion that it's not coordinated, it's disjointed, it's fragmented um, of different actors from both the public and private sector, civil society are involved in the delivery of global public goods or oversight of um, evaluation and monitoring of these um, global goods and that it's a much more fluid process with alliances and partnerships that form, unform, and may come together uh, in different ways at different times. When it comes to teaching, um, because I run a course um, called, it was called Nuts and Bolts of Transnational Governance, and I will stick with that. Um, I try to sort of stamp some order on the great diversity for the students at the beginning by trying to distinguish between different dynamics of transnational governance. Now the first two up there are forms of transgovernmentalism where the interactions are about policy coordination or policy cooperation between government officials in the first case um, who might share um, common issues of a trans, uh, sorry, a cross national um, problem. So an example here is um, the security cooperation that occurs through the Five Eyes um, network, um, which is an Anglosphere um, cooperative venture. Um, Transgovernmentalism that involves um, the partnership or involvement of international organizations is the second one. Um, so it, again, it involves solely official actors. 
And an example here would be the way in which the OECD becomes involved in peer review processes, but also the way in which it, the OECD has acted as a bit of a policy entrepreneur, setting up in issues like, um, it's not a great name, tax inspectors across borders. Okay, so there's all sorts of very, very issue-specific um, networks, uh, alliances that the OECD has played a role um, in establishing. The third one is much more about partnerships between uh, official government or international organization actors and those that come from the corporate sector or from civil society. And an example here is the multi-stakeholder initiative, Gavi, which is also known as the Vaccine Alliance and which um, is interesting because of the way in which the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was central to its initiation in bringing together um, big, big Pharma, the pharmaceutical companies, in conjunction uh, with a range of governments to deliver uh, vaccines to hard to reach um, communities. I'm not in the business here of criticizing these kinds of arrangements. There have been many criticisms of Gavi. What I'm doing is just trying to outline a bit of um, the landscape <laughs> of different initiatives that exist, including uh, a range of um, private initiatives, uh, such as um, standard setting regimes, um, but also the Global Drugs Commission, uh, based in uh, Geneva, is a good example of a private body that mimics the style of um, formal UN uh, commissions. So all these kinds of developments, which I've just developed in this four-way um, division, and I really have only glossed over the very tip of the iceberg, all these sorts of developments do find their way into policy teaching um, and in new kinds of um, institutional formations in um, universities. Whether global policy or transnational administration or whatever it is called um, is develops in a school um, uh, or an institute such as my own, or whether it is just a concentration within an existing um, public policy degree program, but also through things like um, more ad hoc initiatives like summer schools. And then the idea of uh, global policy is also taking shape through the emergence of uh, new books. I'll come to one in a moment. Um, but also journals like um, Global Society, Globalizations, Global Policy, and various others, um, but also book series as well that are emerging in the field of global um, policy and um, transnational administration. So this is the other definition of global policy I was taking about. In a textbook that has now emerged, it came out about two or three months ago, um, which talks about global policy making being more of a patchwork. So this book is much more focused on not the institutions of what they call global governance, but takes what they call a practice approach to see what are the practices that various kinds of official and non-state actors are engaged in to create processes of um, policy coordination or uh, new kinds of uh, regimes. So I hope I'm conveying that I'm not too hung up about what we call the phenomena, okay? It can go by a number of different ways, and I think there is value in having all these different values, uh, sorry, different labels um, and different definitions of what global policy or global public policy might be because it provides a range of different um, perspectives uh, that can be used in, in different kinds of ways. But what I'd like to do now is just step away from global policy as such for a moment and focus more on public policy as a, a general field of um, research and teaching to say that one of the things that I really like about public policy and why 
for me personally, why I abandoned political science and then international relations um, is because, um, and I hope people will agree with me, public policy is much more multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary and is very good at borrowing different concepts, ideas, tools and methods in order to have this problem-focused approach uh, to a range of issues. So this idea of um, trespass really appeals to me as both borrowing but also for this capacity also to upend um, ways of um, traditionally doing things uh, in, and moving into um, different um, shapes. But even though um, public policy is um, interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary, there are discussions, debates within the academy about transdisciplinarity. And I think that is a much harder thing to achieve. Uh, and this is something where um, public policy um, may need to start to look at itself and question uh, the ways in which uh, it goes about teaching, what is included um, in teaching, and how it is uh, developed. And in particular, the idea of moving away um, from the ivory tower stereotype of um, public policy, but not just public policy, most of the, of the university or the academy, and looking at different ways of knowing um, and decentering um, academic positions and what that might mean um, for public policy and also for uh, global policy approaches as well. So I don't know what it's like uh, in your institution, but certainly at EUI, and when I was at CEU, probably even more so, um, this idea of decentering the disciplines uh, was very current um, and something that is um, quite uh, topical. And in particular, looking at the ways in which knowledge or public policy knowledge, you know, what kinds of knowledges are included and those that are um, excluded or not brought into the frame. Um, and part of this is uh, decolonizing um, the curriculum. Now, I would hope that when it comes to um, global policy approaches, that because of its, the nature of its focus and its subject matter, that um, this kind of niche area of uh, research and teaching might better account for the diversity of, of perspectives um, that can be brought into the teaching of um, global policy and public policy more generally. Um, and that also public policy, because of its focus on educating future leaders, future civil servants, also would have this um, openness um, to, to this kind of decentering de uh, ethos. Um, but really, it depends on who teaches it, how it is taught, um, and who actually gets to be the recipient of the scholarships or other forms of assistance for global or international forms of policy education. And I use um, a quote there from the Global D Center, um, organization, uh, which I've only recently discovered, um, which is very much an advocate of um, bringing different kinds of uh, ways of knowing or epistemologies into the academy, but makes the criticism um, of those um, what they call a transnational class of academic professionals. And if I'm honest, I have to admit that I am one of those members of the transnational class of professionals in terms of the opportunities and privileges um, that I've been able to enjoy over the years. And that sort of position, I think, infuses teaching of not just myself, but also a range of others. Now, that's not to say that um, public policy is at all traditional or hidebound. There are um, some interesting developments that are um, being investigated. And while this handbook is not yet being published, it will be soon 
um, this year, I expect. Under the auspices of the International Public Policy Association, there will be a handbook on teaching public policy come out later this year. Uh, so a number of chapters, I'm just focusing on one by Marlene Brands, but one of the interesting things that she uncovered in her research is that public policy, teaching and education is not converging, okay? It's not uh, emulating the North American model. Instead, um, she, she argues that the North American or Anglosphere idea of distinct departments or schools of public policy is actually exceptional and that what we are seeing is um, a very great diversification of the types of programs um, emerging that deliver uh, public policy and in particular that it doesn't necessarily have a disciplinary home in political science or one of the cognate fields. That you are much, you are as likely to find public policy teaching in law departments or business schools as you would in um, political science or, or whatever. And the other thing that she, she notices um, when she does her overview is that um, in the emergence of Asian, African, or Latin American traditions of public policy, there is a process of de-Westernization that is gradually um, changing through processes of what was mentioned earlier about the exchange of ideas, um, policy transfer processes, the adoption of, of some um, um, teaching pedagogies from one place to another. Um, and part of this she also uses um, the phrase tropicalization. I'm not sure I like it. I only heard about it a week ago, and my immediate reaction was, oh, no. Uh, it, I didn't like it as a metaphor, and I'd be very interested to hear if anybody else uh, has heard of, of this as well. Um, but it, it, it's meant to refer to the way in which... Um, ideas and concepts from one place are transformed um, in a process of translation um, once they go into another context. Um, I don't think I want to say much more because I haven't read around this particular topic so much yet, um, but um, apparently this term is rife in this particular um, book, a uh, handbook that will be coming out. But then also the other thing is um, how public policy needs to also consider um, illiberal or authoritarian styles and traditions of public policy in what seems to be an era where um, democracy is in, um, under challenge or in decline and the number of states who claim to be democratic possibly um, reducing. So the identities approach of Marlon Brands is, is one way of thinking about how to have an altered or decentered view of public policy teaching. I think I, think I want to move away from that. I also don't um, feel comfortable with transdisciplinarity. Um, and one of the things that I hope to do in future with my colleague Kim Maloney is to look at um, how the idea of public policy is part of a linked ecology. So this would be drawing on some organisational sociology concepts um, to look at the ways in which um, public policy programmes uh, teachers and it, um, also schools of are engaged with other kinds of actors. Now, again, I'm hoping um, that you would agree with me that many policy programs are under pressure to have impact or social relevance or to be of some utility to various kinds of stakeholders. And many programs have sought to initiate a range of activities uh, 
for students, whether it's uh, internships or capstone projects, the way in which um, many academics do consultancy work or they're seconded to government institutions. So um, there is a lot of interaction and initiation from the academy to be um, relevant in various kinds of ways could be with the media, could be with um, civil society organisations. But that's an approach that looks at what the academy does outwards. I would want to transfer that gaze the other way around and look at the ways in which um, outside communities um, enter into the academy and become engaged in public policy teaching and uh, training. Um, and I'm going to have to skip over this in the interests of time and go to one example. Um, and I chose this one because I think it's also a good one of, dip, of um, disciplinary trespass because one of the things that I've noticed about being involved in doing global policy research work is that I'm doing a lot more, along with other people, um, on new forms of diplomacy, whether it's cultural diplomacy, health, science, environmental, or other kinds of diplomacy where non-state actors become involved. But um, it's also an interesting um, area where governments and international organizations are developing programs that are for education and training on their own, okay? So UNITAR is a very good example. It has many, many degree programs that it delivers and it um, provides accreditation for in a way. Um, but it also partners with um, a number of universities in the delivery of some of those um, programs. So this is about international organizations, but also governments becoming teachers and trainers um, of public policy, which I know has had a long uh, tradition, um, but I'm interested in sort of looking at how the entry of those uh, actors starts to change the way in which um, academia is done um, and how teaching is actually delivered and the pedagogies um, that potentially go with it. So I'll end in just a moment. Um, I'm hoping um, that you, you uh, consider that um, global policy studies is a way to break down or to reassemble even um, the way in which we think about um, how the globe is divided up and how governance across borders uh, happens. Certainly there is a growth uh, of journals, courses, degrees um, and a community of scholars in this area. Um, and that global policy studies can be part of the, way, of the move away from Western-centric uh, approaches without throwing away or dismissing um, the canon that already uh, exists. And let me end by saying that, um, thank you for inviting me, but that uh, I think eBay is a very good example of already entrenching uh, ideas about uh, global policy through the kinds of activities it does with the, the summer school, which I think has been going for a decade, maybe longer, um, but also in this new degree that you'll be delivering. So thank you, and I hope you have some questions and comments. I think everyone hear me if I speak like this. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation. And uh, well, the question I have is mostly regarding this uh, framework that you proposed on transnational governance. So given these uh, three axes that you mentioned on, uh, what is it, 
coordination being more vertical or more horizontal, uh, partnerships being more homogenous or more heterogeneous in terms of its actors, and initiatives being bottom, more bottom-up or more top-down. And this uh, triple axis, do you see some form of trade-off in terms of efficiency? Say, as you move upwards or downwards along one of these axes, is there something lost there? Or, for example, is this more the case of a trilemma, like the macroeconomic policy trilemma, where you can be at the top in two axes, but then you can't be simultaneously at the top in all three? Thank you. Um, yes, I think there are trade-offs. I think it's a very messy order where there is a lot of duplication. And let me give you just one example. I've recently been doing, um, well, haven't we all been doing work on COVID? Okay. Um, but uh, what I've been looking at uh, with a colleague um, is global health commissions. Okay. Um, we only look at four health global commissions as just the first instance of duplication and inefficiencies that are uh, surrounding um, attempts to grapple with policy problems. So, as I say, we only look at four, but there are actually many other kinds of global commissions focused on um, COVID. Um, so there was a papal commission on uh, COVID. Um, you know, so there were a range of different um, bodies. The, the official ones, the two WHO-initiated uh, ones, another one called Reform for Resilience, which was an entirely private initiative, and then some might have also heard of the SACS Lancet Commission on, on COVID. So I just raised these as to, to say it's much more disorderly um, uh, than I presented in that four-way um, cut. Um, than, than I wanted to. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there we go. Does that work? Um, is this thing on? Um, thanks, Diane. This was, this was very interesting. And I'm stuck on the definitional difficulties that, that um, the field and also your program has. And I'm stuck on this notion of coordination acts, and and I wanna I wanna see how how uh, it, how we, you you might think, further think about this um, because it's very interesting to me. So, can governance be uncoordinated? Right? Isn't it the the essence of governance structures to provide incentives to coordinate this kind of action? Um, in the same way, aren't patchworks to be avoided, right? So I'm, I'm American, we have patchworks of regulation, and as soon as there is, as soon as that statement is used, it's a, it's a, it's a terrible thing. It's a pejorative thing about a, 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 it, 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 about a regulatory environment. You can do one thing in one state that you can't do in another. So, so I, I say those couple of things provocatively to just sort of make to make the point, um, to, to make the question a bit, a bit uh, um, clearer. But the most interesting thing for me here and in the context of this um, round table and panel today is how do students in your program learn the skills of policy coordination? What kind of things do they do as a sort of practical skill building kind of activity because that those those are obviously extremely important and and um, fascinating thanks yes I think coordination is desirable but I think the problem that exists in many of the kinds of global pathologies that we encounter and the way in which they cross borders, whether it's disease or human trafficking or whatever, is that it's happening in non-jurisdictional areas in the sense that um, who has authority for dealing with them? And I think that is a very large part of the problem, which leads to a lot of this uncoordinated action and um, goodwill private initiatives um, that sometimes might cause more harm than intended. Um, so I actually like the, the phrase used um, 
in the textbook I mentioned by Puglio and Therrien of patchwork. I don't find it, I don't think they intended it as a negative or pejorative term. Um, but I think they also meant it as a sort of quasi-coordinated way in the sense that you stitch things together as best you can with whatever you have at hand and then maybe some things will institutionalise into a more recognisable format over, over time. Um, but going to your question about what are the skills of policy coordination that are taught in, in the School of Transnational Governance, in actuality, it's the traditional schools that I think that you find in most um, do, uh, policy um, programs. Um, so things like negotiation, um, how to do policy writing, um, economic analysis. Uh, so, okay, one of the things that we say uh, in the School of Transnational Governance when nobody's looking is we're just a school of public policy. Okay, I'm actually a discordant voice. I say, no, we're not, all right? We're also a school of public and international affairs, okay? Because I think a school of public policy um, tends to take the discussion of, of identity, again, away towards public management, um, public administration, sometimes law, and takes it away from um, development studies. Okay, or, or other kinds of aspects um, that are equally legitimate to be included. But really, if you look at our school, because it wants to belong in what is seen to be a leading policy school, which is informed already by those schools that already exist, but also accreditation agencies, and the way in which accreditation agencies are playing a role in, t in terms of benchmarking, but also determining what are the competences that graduates of schools of public policy or degree programs are having a very significant um, and I think powerful long-term effect on um, what policy graduates uh, will have in the future. Mm. <laughs> well, we have to think a lot about certain things. Any, anyone has any other questions or comments? So, No other questions or comments? Okay, in that case, Diane, thank you very much for uh, all this uh, food for thought, as, as they say. I, I, uh, there's too much for me right now. I, I have to, I ha I have to, to, <laughs> to go over my notes and, and try to digest everything you said. And, and, um, and uh, hopefully we can be in contact in order to uh, learn more from your experience and um, and share ours, mm -hmm. of course. Um, okay, well then, thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are going to continue the session with a round table. Um, we have here today three well-known uh, speakers. The idea of the round table is that, first of all, I'm going to introduce them. Uh, then we'll have a 10 minutes presentation of each of them trying to answer the question that we have in this table, which is linking policy and politics. Uh, what should a master's in public policy program for the contemporary, uh, contemporary area look like? So that's what the speakers will try to answer. And then we'll have a debate uh, and you can ask questions to them or we will come up with, with questions. So, uh, first of all, let me, let me introduce our speakers. Uh, Mark Balaguer, who is in the middle, will be the first one. Uh, so, Mark is an economist and has a PhD in public policy and social transformation from Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona. Since October 2015, he is the executive director of Ivalua. Ivalua is the Catalan Institute of Public Policy Evaluation. 
He has worked at the Generalitat de Catalunya in two main departments, economics and labor, and he has been a consultant of the World Bank and a visiting fellow in the Department of Sociology at Harvard University. So that's Mark. Uh, let me go through Anthony Michael Bertelli. He's a, pub, a professor in public policy and political science at the Pennsylvania State University, where he holds the Douglas S. and Joyce L. Uh, Sherwin Chair of Liberal Arts, uh, honoring Frank Whitmore. He's also a senior research fellow at eBay, editor-in-chief of the Journal of Public Policy, and fellow at, uh, of the National Academy of Public Administration. He studies mainly how politics shapes public policies and how they are implemented, and what that means for democracy. So, and finally, Mark Esteva at the end of the table, is a professor of public management at the University College London at the School of Public Policy. He co-directs the Global Executive MPA, jointly uh, offered by New York University and UCL. He's also a visiting professor at the Sade Business School, uh, Ramon Llull University, where he is the director of the Sade Center uh, for Public Governance. Uh, he currently serves as editor of Local Government Studies, and he's part of the editorial board of several international journals. His research mainly focuses on how to improve the implementation of public services. So you can see that uh, they've done a lot and uh, they are uh, very well known. So uh, if, um, if you agree, Mark, we can start with you. And you have around 10, 15 minutes. Thanks very much. And, and first of all, I, I would like to congratulate eBay to, to set up a, a master in public policy with uh, a strong focus on evaluation. And I will be talking specifically about evaluation, and I will give th three three ideas uh, on on how the on how is important to, to train evaluation in, in those kind of, of, of programs. And I will speak about like uh, speak about th three. I was thinking what would be interesting to 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 stay today and. I found like there are like three paradoxes, not exactly paradoxes, but but uh, there are there are important for the the, the, the teaching of evaluation. No? If the, the first one is if we look at uh, the the policy cycle as we as we can see in all the political science or public policy handbooks, we can we find always the policy cycle and. And if we look at the evaluation, it, the, the, the policy like the, the post policy cycle, we 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 found first of all the agenda setting, the the formulation of policy options, implementation, and finally evaluation. And at, at the real life, the evaluation is not in the policy cycle. No, you you there are a lot of um, you, you find policy formulation, decision-making implementation, but very, very rarely we, 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 the policies are evaluating. And the policies are evaluating. And if we, we, we look why, in Spain, for example, um, there was a survey, a recent survey about the state of institutionalization of evaluation, and the, the, the survey recognized that the, very little is evaluated in general at the different levels of administration. In Catalonia, we, we did a survey in, 20, in 2020, and three or four regional ministers considered that there should be more evaluation practices, and also we did a, a small survey in, in, in a sample of Catalan NGOs, and we, we found that um, very, very few of them ha has, have departments with people with responsibilities in evaluation tasks. When we, we try to find the reasons of this, um, the departments of, of, of the regional council say that they don't have time and they don't have resources to, to schedule evaluation strategies. And in fact, what that reflects is that the evaluation is not in the policy cycle. In, and when we ask what, what also are the reasons of this lack of evaluation as a public practice, they some forty percent of, of those entities say that they don't have knowledge and skills. So the, this is one one of the first idea that I want to to, 
to state. After that, a second idea is that the, the difference between the, the, what the, the perception of the public servants is and what is the, the importance attributed to, to policy evaluation. And as here is a, a graph we, we ask to to the, the, the public ser, ser, servants of the regional government that they have responsibility. So they, they, they have middle directors or, 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 or managers. And these, these are the issues that they consider the more important. And they say that the first issue that is important for them is the person manager, person management, also strategic planning, change management. But the, uh, the, last, the last thing that they attribute important is policy evaluation and the use of evidence. But then we, we found that, uh, I don't know if you are familiar with it, but there is a document from the, the UK government that talk about the policy professional standards. And one of the, the this document, the, the policy professional standard, states what are the, the skills that are needed in 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 the in the regional in, in the British government, and and it found that there are three issues that are very important, and that the three pillars. The first one is the evidence, the analysis and use of evidence. Also, the delivery of public the delivery, the public delivery of services, and the politics, which is the whole uh, you know, as what we know as politics. And this document is very interesting because it states what at the different levels of when you get you, you, you arrive to work in a in the public administration. What are the skills that you have to adopt in those three pillars? And so there is a mismatch between the importance that the, the public managers attribute to the, 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 the skills that they have and they, they should enhance and the importance of the skill that should be provided in terms of, a, in, in this case, in the, the, the UK level, that they consider that evidence and evaluation is essential for the policy profession. And the, the third idea that I, 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 I want to, to refer is um, that the evaluation is more, in, the more and more important in, in, in the different governments. So now the, for, with, with the next generation, the next generation initiative, um, the, there is a, the, the evaluation is, is adopting the more and more importance also, uh, at the Spanish level, um, last year it was approved the Spanish institutionalization of evaluation law, and this law states that th there should be evaluation agendas at the state, at the level of the state government. And after that, there are been appearing different initiatives at regional governments to to set up similar laws that are, that are creating agendas for evaluation, and that is happening in the Basque Country, also in Andalusia and Castilla León. They are doing laws in order to, to set up agendas for evaluation, and they are saying that this evaluation should be done by, by people at administration, but also with the, with the collaboration of, of, the admin, of, of the universities, research centers, and so on. And in Catalonia, um, during the last 10 years, there is a strategy in order to also to foster the promotion of evaluation. Now there is an agenda of 125 evaluation just um, in the regional government for the, two, the, the next two years. Also the creation of a professional network in order to, to foster collaboration between academia and government um, in the realization of evaluation, also community of practice, and the development of funds for, for, for evaluate public policies. So at the end, um, there is a need for a specific training in evaluation. Quantitative and qualitative techniques are necessary, but also the, the work for a specific evaluation. You know, there are 
repositories in, in different, in, in UK, in US, and those repositories, uh, you, you can find example of very interesting evaluations. And also this, this evaluation should be, uh, should be also studied in, 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 in specific training programs. Also, sometimes the, 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 the programs, the training programs in, in evaluation, they give a lot of importance of impact and the adoption of experimental <coughs> evaluation. This is important. But also, um, if you look at the needs of the administration, there is a, 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 there is a lot of need of knowing the importance of consistency in public policy. So there are um, evaluations of design evaluations, implementation evaluation, needs assessment that are very, very important also, and not only the impact evaluation. And, and also, if, if we want to, to, to set a, a, a program in public policy, it's important also to know what are the strategies that the different countries are adopting, are adopting in order to institutionalize the evaluation, because this is something that is important for the improvement of, of public policy. And that's it. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me, and uh, congratulations, Jacint. Welcome to the club of people who, who have to deal with administering public policy programs. My remarks this afternoon are, are meant to focus on the landscape and the context of public policy education in the United States. Um, I know this context um, because I've served on the faculties of public affairs schools for my entire career. Um, I've held administrative roles in three of them, um, the Price School at the University of Southern California, the Wagner School at um, NYU, and now a startup school just like what eBay is doing or what Eli is doing at, uh, at Penn State. And I'm from Pennsylvania, so this was kind of an exciting thing to, to try. I say that to myself when I deal with frustration. Um, I think, I think that public policy education in the U.S. provides some helpful suggestions for how eBay's new program can grow to occupy a unique place in European public policy, but I don't think it necessarily sets up a model for the same. So, so what, I, what I hope to do is tell a story um, that will include some discussion of the accreditation process that uh, um, Diane brought up but to do so in a way that suggests that you can sort of take bits from here and there. Public policy programs in the US took root in the 1960s. Berkeley was established in 1969, the LBJ School at the University of Texas in 1970. This happened for two general reasons. One was a response to the strong degree of technical expertise but lack of political and management skill of the, of the uh, military advisors in World War II, and then the, the, the whiz kids who showed up in the, in the Johnson administration. Be and secondly, because of the explosion of social programs in the Johnson era, great society, right? So um, the United States becomes, the United States federal government becomes a provider of social services and a provider of money to um, states through block grants to provide social services. And people in all these different areas need, need expertise. So policy programs find um, find a place there. Public administration programs had been, a, had been around for 50 years longer. Princeton was established in 1930. Harvard was established in 1936. They too were born because of the birth of the federal administrative state in the um, post-progressive era, the exploding importance of local administration in the wake of that era as well. Like policy schools, public administration programs were a, <clears throat> were a source of expertise for these nascent institutions at the various levels. 
the combination of these public policy and public or the co combination of public policy and public administration under the umbrella term of public affairs, which is common in the U.S., seems sensible from an academician's perspective. Researchers in each field draw upon theoretical insights from the same set of disciplines. Economics regarding the design and evaluation of efficient and effective public policies. Political science regarding the processes by which policies are made and implemented. Sociology regarding the social impacts of policies and the social nature of policy problems in the theory of organizations. And psychology regarding the behavioral impacts of policies and behavior within organizations. These fields are represented in the core courses of each type of program. However, the two fields, public policy and public administration, have come to train practitioners in very different professions. Public administration programs train public managers, including financial managers, of public, governmental, and nonprofit organizations. Their goal, as my mentor, the late Larry Lynn, wrote, is competent administrative management and the creation and maintenance of effective organizations legitimated by constitutional and statutory authority. Public policy schools train managers too, but when they do that, they prepare them to be political actors. As Larry Lynn also put it, the goal is effective policy management on behalf of identifiable social outcomes legitimated, the emphasis varies, by substantive coherence, by voting constituencies and stakeholders, or by deliberative processes. This view of public management is connected with the rise of a unique profession for which American public policies train many students, maybe most of its students the ones who don't go to work for consulting firms. Public policy analysis is a profession that centers on one specific function, arguing with evidence, speaking truth to power in the political and administrative arenas. Trained policy analysts are a large part of the expanding cadre of policy advisors that provide evidence-based arguments to politicians and public managers alike. Indeed, it sees both politicians and managers as, pub as political actors. The well-trained policy analyst must therefore have a potent combination of two specific skills. First, the ability to provide reasoned advice and evidence-based arguments for policy choices and their implementation, and the understanding and know-how to work within and to lead organizations, those two things. What results from all this is, that, is, the is the canonical work product of the policy analyst, the policy memorandum. Each memo contains analysis and argument with evidence. It proposes a policy choice and or implementation strategy from among a, a set of alternatives. In their core courses, as well as in a set of topical electives from housing to the environment to health to national security, policy memos are frequently assigned and critiqued throughout the term. Training for these two professions of public manager and policy analyst is often housed within schools of public affairs, as I mentioned, which can also include other types of training as well, social work, urban planning, things like this. Both types of programs are accredited by the same body, the Network of Schools of Public Policy Affairs and Administration, NASPA. NASPA used to be, the, the first letter used to represent national, but now you too, and you too can be accredited by, by NASPA as well. But not all programs are accredited. Some very good programs do not seek accreditation and have never, Princeton, Harvard, Chicago, for instance. The process takes time, significant financial and staff resources. It requires a particular organizational structure for faculty governance of programs. It also requires substantial faculty effort. We have had to stall our effort because of resource constraints. So, 
so these things are uh, um, these things are difficult. They're they, but they can also be helpful if you think about what they actually do provide. Even if a program doesn't seek accreditation, some of the principles are helpful, and I would argue even essential for an MPP program to be successful. The accreditation of programs by NASPA is based on a set, as Diane mentioned, of competencies that public policy programs must provide to students. These are the capability to lead and manage in public governance, to per participate in and contribute to the policy process, to articulate and apply a public service perspective, to communicate and interact productively with a diverse and changing workforce and citizenry. Notice how general they are. The job of the MPP program is not just to provide broad exposure to each of these areas, but also, as my question to Diane suggests, to confer tangible skills. For, inst for example, a program should not just provide creative and visionary leadership in challenging areas of public policy. It should also teach its students to set goals, to design programs, and to marshal resources to address specific problems. The requirement of tangible skills also applies to individual courses, particularly those that form a re required core. For instance, students just don't just develop an understanding of the policy process, they also learn to prepare policy memos that recommend one policy proposal over another on the basis of quantitative and qualitative evidence. Within these guidelines, schools and their faculties have broad latitude to offer an innovative curriculum. For instance, professional competencies are frequently enhanced through assignments and experiences like service learning activities, client-based field projects within courses, role plays and simulations, internships, instructors who work as professional policy analysts, instructors who are academics but also provide policy advice, and ongoing relationships between the program and public service employers. The curriculum and supporting activity must also sub support the mission of the program and the school in which, in which it is housed. The mission of eBay is to promote scientific knowledge through advanced research and postgraduate education with the aim of increasing the understanding of our world's global challenges in the domains of politics and international relations. It's useful for any program's leaders to think about these two questions with respect to the, to the mission. How can what students do and learn in any course or activity connect to the mission? In a specialized, a specialized place like eBay, the mission can inspire competencies beyond the five that I, that I listed and create some real opportunities. Secondly, what can students who complete a specialized track of the MPP program do? How is that track connected to the mission? And that's true of any track that's, that's, that's developed as a part of this. And finally, I said two questions, but evidently I've added a third. <laughs> How does the mission of the MPP program contribute to eBay's gestalt, right? So is, is how is eBay made better and more, more able to meet its broader mission by the existence of, of the program in public policy? Seen through the most favorable light, which I am trying to do, rather than complain about procedures and things like that. That's what it, accreditation actually tries to do, to get you to think about some important areas in which anybody who participates in, in the arena of public policy must be trained and must know something. And to it, by making connections between those aims and the things that are taught in courses, bring together a program that gives, that gives students some tangible skills beyond just a discussion of, of, of problems. And it, it, again, in its most positive light, 
it allows a program to contribute to a broader school by making these kinds of connections. Now, am I saying that you should go through accreditation? Good heavens, no. <laughs> but thinking in this way actually does help help uh, um, it, it, it help a program figure out where its opportunities are and how it can be a unique player in a broader and increasingly competitive landscape. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think we can clap at the end, no? <laughs> you deserve the clap, but we'll say yeah. it for later. Thank okay. you very much, Mark. Um, so I'm the last one. I'm the one standing between your questions and, and as well. Try to be brief. Um, first of all, uh, thank you very much for your invitation. It's great to be here. Thank you also, uh, Diane, Mark, and Tony for your great remarks. Um, this is exciting, you know, a new program in, in public policy. This is what we like, a good program within a good university, or in this case, a good uh, joint venture of universities with good academics and with surely good students, good students to be. Okay, so that's, that sounds great. I just have a few final remarks about, I would say, opportunities and challenges. Um, opportunities and challenges for training in public policy related areas. Um, let me start with maybe the, the opportunities, which even though they, they seem positive, they're actually a little bit sad in a way, especially the first one. Why do we need public policy so much? Um, we actually have a huge space within public policy that we are not occupying at the moment. Diane, you guys have started to do it, which is great, which is everything that has to do with executive training. Because in most OECD countries, sadly, most top uh, decision makers, policy makers, uh, happen to be politically appointed. So, you know, if you ask society that will tell you you should hire someone that has already received the training, which makes a lot of sense, but that's not exactly how it works. Particularly, for example, in Catalonia or in Spain, uh, some of you, I'm not going to say the name, but it's quite obvious, have already written that when we have elections, between 95 and 100 percent of the top political uh, decision makers, policy makers, you might call it, change. It's actually considered of bad taste not to resign if your political party loses the election. So it's of bad taste to have to wait for a new political party to have to fire you. Okay? Um, and one of the main reasons for that is that depending on the political party and depending on the country, but these policy makers do give a percentage of their salaries to the political party, which has, you know, basically means effectively that they are financing in a way, not all of it of course, but they are financing part of this political party. So it's, you know, it's very nice to think that they should be well trained when they reach this position. But I think it's more practical to think that in some cases they will be not. You know, their main asset will be that they are very smart for sure, but they also are loyal to the political party or at least have the trust of the person in charge of that political party for that particular government. Um, so I think it's our duty to try to train them. It's our duty to try to train those top decision makers. Uh, and I think that here again we have a huge opportunity. Um, the second opportunity that I see is public policy has started to approach and merge with this idea of, of public administration. So I think that the difference between masters in public policy and masters in public administration, I like to say they are different in all and important aspects, which is a nice way of saying that they're pretty much the same, or they are becoming uh, very similar. Why? Because I think that we have started to understand that the implementation aspect of any public policy is paramount, it's very important. You know, a very well-designed policy can have awful results if poorly implemented, but at the same time, a poorly designed policy might actually end up having good results if those in charge of implementing it have some room of maneuver and some skills and abilities to try to fix um, those um, design problems, so to speak. The third opportunity that I see is I'm not sure how to call this. Maybe we could call it a, a sort of marketization of public policy, or, or in the case is the fact that our students now finishing masters in public policy do not necessarily end up in government. 
Not at all. Actually, the, the, and unfortunately, in some cases, you could think, the top ones end up in the corporate world. Our students, some of them end up in Amazon. Actually, the head of Amazon in Spain is a former public policy student of mine. Not finance. Not, you know, an MBA sort of student, but a public policy one. Why? Because I think that especially top corporations have understood that the relationship that they must have with government, with the public sector overall, is of extreme importance for them. Tell that, for example, to the head of Cabify or Uber, how important it is for them to have a good relationship to really understand, for example, how the regulatory process works and have a say to that. Yeah? So we are starting to see how public policy is opening to the non-profit but also the for-profit sectors. And I think that this gives us much more you know, appetite of this market for our students. Which, if you are going to be a student, I think that's, that's great news. And also on our side, it's also great news because I think that the demand will increase over the next years. But um, we're not the only ones that have realized that the demand is increasing, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, one of the other things that, that I've realized it's probably not the right time to talk about universities and, and finance models and business models within universities, but universities care a lot about training, doing research, but more and more they care a lot about getting money, resources, to finance those activities, right? Um, I come from the UK, in which is particularly <laughs> significant nowadays, and what we have seen is that other departments have realized the appealing of the concept public policy, of the public policy concept. So much so that we have started seeing a lot of programs that have the word public policy within their titles. And it's not, you know, I, I was very, um, I, I was listening to you today very carefully because I fully agree that we need, I mean, public policy, it's uh, collaborative in nature. And we have, we have actually a lot of different concepts from different fields. And it should be that way. But at the same time, what we are seeing is that other fields are borrowing. I'm not really sure if it's the theories, but certainly the title of public policy. And they will do things, for example, public policy on climate change and sustainability with 30 credits on public policy and 140 in climate change and sustainability. Not to say it's not important. It's very important. But at least in my experience, one of the things that we've learned with public policy is that the core aspects seem to be quite the same regardless of the area in which you try to apply them. So if you want to be an expert in public policy in sustainability or climate change, it should probably be the other way around. You should probably have 120 credits on public policy, maybe 30 on climate change sustainability. Okay. I hope there is no one here on climate change sustainability that would. But, you know, both important topics. But I would warn us about different departments borrowing the title public policy. One of the other opportunities that I see is that public policy is, is, a, is, a, is a practical science. It's, it's really about making things happen, right? Um, even though if, if you come to one of my classes that might not sound very obvious, because I'm very theoretical sometimes, but the idea is that with public policy you get to change things for real. You get to have an impact. Now, this idea of having an impact makes us attractive for organizations outside the university. And we've, we've talked a lot, and you will hear a lot in the following years, the need to stretch, uh, to reduce the gap between, some people call it the real wall, as if this was somehow unreal. I've never been a great fan of this term. But between university and organizations that are outside universities. And I think that we have probably been understanding this relationship a little bit wrong because when I analyze certain programs, what I see is, yeah, lectors use a lot of real life examples. That's very good. And then there are some managed practices at the end of the program, which usually mean for the organization that they get, in the worst cases, free labor. And in not so worst cases, students that will work for you know, a very small amount of money. And I think that this connection should really be about bringing solutions to the problems that these organizations face or must be facing in the future. 
And universities should be good at that because we actually study these solutions. It's true that we are always a little bit slower because, you know, once things happen in this real world, we need four years to collect data and study it and then go back to the real world and explain that very same thing. But that's our role, and that's part of what we do. So I think that when doing these collaborations with real world organizations, we really should be able to think how we can help them besides providing you know, two students that will devote 20 hours per week during three months in the summer. What are the solutions? What are the studies that we are doing that could have an impact within this organization? So I, I see this as another potential venue to keep working on. And finally, um, it's both an opportunity and also probably the, the first challenge. As a program director, the most difficult question that I have, at least for myself, is how much methods should I put into this program? How much methods? For example, for executive training, should I teach them how to run a regression? Are they going to run away if I try to teach you know, a 50-year-old public manager, general director of a public agency, how to run a regression? Does he or she need to know that? Um, I'm not sure about the answer. I can tell you that I, I, I find like a, a nice compromise saying, well, they should know how to interpret the results of a regression. Between us, I know that this is being streamed. I hope that this is not being recorded, or at least that, that, that my university is not going to hear this. I don't think that's a great solution, really, because I, I still don't quite know the difference between understanding how to interpret a regression and understanding how to run it. The difference is knowing which buttons you have to click in Stata, which code you have to put in R. So, but that's the idea, right? How much methods do we need? And in terms of methods, um, I think that the main challenge also here is how do we understand policy analysis? And I think here again we have a challenge and again an opportunity because policy analysis have been dominated from its very origins from economists. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but the main question has always been which has been the impact of this particular policy or program? Can we compare program A with program B and see which one works best? Right? Do public schools work better than you know, uh, public-private partnerships, or schools that apply here, a public-private collaboration? And I think that this is key, this is very important, but I think it also misses a very also important aspect, which is I'm not so worried as a citizen on whether A performs better than B. For me, the key question is how to make A and B perform better. How we can actually learn how to run these policy programs better. And this connects policy analysis with policy implementation and with public management. And this means that, you know, and, and policy analysis, I think it's moving towards this. Uh, you, Mark, mentioned some of these aspects like um, design evaluation. Can we try to analyze the policy before we run it? Because at least we can know, for example, which are the indicators that we should be collecting to analyze the impact of that particular policy at the end of the program. So I think we are moving towards that direction. But the very fact, for example, that we, in Catalonia, we have uh, an agency that is dedicated to evaluation means that we are at a point in which we acknowledge that evaluation is important, but it's, we don't have the muscle yet within each governmental department to have their own team that will be evaluating. We have some of them, but we still need a main agency. And you know, thanks God that we have it. Um, but at some point, I wish that we live in a country in which you know, Evalua wouldn't be needed, not because it's not important, but because it's so important that it would be embedded within every single public agency, every single you know, main governmental body. Um, so I think we still have a lot um, to walk in this path, so to speak. And then what we are seeing is also, at the same time, as people learn the importance of data for policy making and evidence for policy making, we have started to see how we are misusing some of this evidence for policy, I'm not sure if policy making or policy justifying may be a better term. Um, how we are starting to take some evidence to justify policies that, true, they have some evidence behind, but I think the general public is still it's not equipped or well equipped enough to realize that you know this particular evaluation is not really well done or it's just not the whole picture that we have. Okay, we have a lot of examples in our country and also in, in other OECD countries. 
um, coming to an end. Um, we have also seen, I will say, a, a large trend on globalization and new technologies in the sense that we have also this, this discussion in the UK, for example, I'm the director of a program, we call it a global executive MPA, New York and London. Because as everyone knows, you know, the wall starts in New York and ends in London. <laughs> it's an Anglo-Saxon program, right? And we try to be very, I really hope they're not watching, but we try to be really open. But at the end of the day, it's an Anglo-Saxon program, right? Um, this is not how we should certainly understand globalization. Um, so I, I, I really would push ourselves to try to go beyond that. And certainly with new technologies, for example, we have banned our students from using ChatGPT. Even that, this particular year, I was finishing my, uh, I was finishing revising my essays uh, last week. I ha don't have a single essay that has been poorly written. All of them look great. Uh, it might be a coincidence, who knows? But the idea is that, for example, are we going to teach writing policy memos? <laughs> are we going to keep teaching how we should be writing policy memos? if ChatGTP writes better policy memos than most of our colleagues in the World Bank, or maybe we are going to focus on which is the particular evidence that we should include in a policy memo so that ChatGPT will write it in seconds. In a similar way that we are saying, you know, we don't need to train you how to run a regression manually. We have to train you on having a criteria of how and when regressions are to be used. But you know, it would be impossible for us to conceive an MPP program in which our Python, Stata, whatever program you want to use, um, would not be used. And instead, you will be asked to do it manually, right? Um, I put the example of policy memos, because that, that's one that, that seems reasonably straightforward, but I'm sure there are many more. How fast are we going to be able to jump into this wagon? Um, at UCL, certainly not very fast. But I, I trust that you guys <laughs> will do it faster than us, OK? And I'll finish here. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I think it was uh, enlightening. And it gave a, you touch upon many different topics that I think it will be very good now for the debate. So from policy evaluation that Mark was telling us about the need of policy evaluation that sometimes we think it's there, but it's not really there, or an overview of the US uh, evolution of, of uh, public policy schools and how we understand the competencies uh, within that. And uh, Mark uh, finishing around opportunities and challenges that we have when, when we teach uh, public policy and, what I, and, and where we want to go and how we t uh, touch upon the real world. So there many things have been said. Um, so I have already have some questions, but <laughs> if uh, you want to ask any question to them, we can uh, Start now. We have around 30 minutes, so uh, feel free to ask questions. Hello, um, my name is Robert Kizik. I'm the head of studies here. Um, we have programs in international relations, international security, international development, among others. And one of the trends over the last few years that's most evident is that people, students that we have, are interested in things like uh, importance of race, the importance of gender, identity, decentering of knowledge, thinking critically about the way Western rationalism is at the heart of many of our disciplines. To what extent do you think that the new masters of public policy will either resonate with those feelings of students? Or do you think students who come to this program, and if we are talking about using strong um, sort of analysis through econometrics, through sort of efficiency, these, these core concepts which are at the heart of Western rationalism, are students going to fit in, or will they feel, sort of feel a bit like their interests and agendas are different to those of perhaps a growing proportion of our other students? I'm happy to respond to that from, from some of the experience that I've had with, with our programs. Um, we get the same students. Our domestic policy students are 
appalled by racial violence in the United States. They're, uh, they're energized by the, the rise of right-wing politicians and all these kinds of things. And they're also looking for, like, as, as public policy students have always been, they're, they're looking for a way to change the world, right? They're looking for a way to street, speak truth to power, right? And these, so these students are always there in our, and, and I would say that, I, I, I can't say that there are more of them at the moment, but I can say that the schools and, and public policy programs are doing more to respond to those to those kind of things. So I'll tell you one experience and, and make one, one argument that I've been making in, in uh, the context of the startup program at Penn State. So when I was vice dean at NYU, we saw an explosive interest in students who wanted to follow a sort of advocacy track, right? The president of the United States was a community organizer. So where is that? Um, who's teaching rules for radicals? That kind of that kind of thing, right? It turned out it was me in introduction to public policy, but but that was the nature of that was the nature of the program in responding to that student body. But we created what initially seemed like an odd idea was to create a, a track in the program for advocacy, to to channel people's energies toward actually making those arguments. And it was wildly successful. In fact, um, those students who were, who were perplexed by, um, you know, d d taking economic analysis courses and the way in which, I mean, you can't blame me for the way that politics was taught, but, uh, but uh, um, me alone, at least. But, the, it, there, we, we created this track, gave them, gave them um, internships, teachers, um, and guest speakers, all kinds of events that put them in the company of people who were arguing for a change and arguing for a change in very, very local levels. So for instance, we had tremendous involvement in the outer boroughs. The, Queens is the sort of immigration capital of the United States, and there were immigrant activists who worked very closely with us to, to pull these, these kind of things together. I do believe very strongly that those things belong in, in public policy education, and, and at, at the risk of taking too much time, so I will curtail myself here. Um, we, my new school is in, a, is in a particularly interesting place when it comes to this problem because we're, we're within a college of liberal arts. So when we hire people, you know, and you come and you're a political scientist, we expect you to publish in those political science journals and do all these kind of things because you're, you're in a college of liberal arts and you're being evaluated by, by us. However, colleges of liberal arts are also places for critical thinking. And there are places that, you know, we have a huge humanities presence in the, in the College of Liberal Arts. And I've argued very strongly to, to bring that back into, into public policy education in a place where it has been. So I've been teaching courses in normative analysis, um, you know, efficiency equity trade-offs aren't going to cut it, particularly when something like equity is actually quite hard to define from a theoretical perspective. Ethical, democratic, moral analysis can be done as systematically as policy evaluation, in, a, in particularly in a quanti quantitative sense. And we should be as systematic about that as we are with our, uh, with our econometric analysis. Because ultimately, when you get this evidence, when you, when you say, this works, right, and you, 
what do you do with that as a policy analyst? What do you do with that as a practitioner? You have to go and make an argument. That's why we teach you to write those mem memos <laughs> so that you can present those in coherent ways. And when you put that argument together, you've got to, you're, you're arguing to do something to change a little part of the world. You're gonna make someone worse off than they were before. You're gonna make someone better off at the expense of that other person. This is not, that there's, there's, there's a sort of moral dimension of those kind of things. And so we try to build those, those kinds of things in and we have, we've hired an ethics and public policy now and we're, we're, we're trying to shape the curriculum and the, and the you know, co-curricular activities, if you will, to try to address those kind of things. So, so it's really important, it's a really important thing to do and it's probably as big of a challenge for the programs that you are discussing, Robert, as it is for our public policy programs. Would you like to say something? No. Sorry about the No, no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to Thank you very much. I'll be brief because I've already asked the question. Um, but now, uh, since you were mentioning this demand for people that are going to do things like evaluation and this the increasing recognition that this is important, as we're increasing the supply in, this, in these skills, do you have any, does your experience point towards any strategies to making sure that this supply meets the demand? Uh, what are some best practices? Is it the way of a think tank of creating uh, a series of internships or getting the would-be graduates more engaged with either local or transnational NGOs? So that would be the first question. And the second question would be, uh, also regarding the, the issue of method, methodology and, and teaching, because this is some a discussion that we've been having here at eBay, not just for, for this program, but for all of them. And I just wanted to get uh, a sense on if you have any, um, let's say, frameworks or grounding principles in terms of methodological teaching. For example, do uh, executive graduates or let's say less uh, quantitative oriented uh, students and graduates, do they respond better to things like DAGs, or directed acyclic graphs than they do to regressions? Or what, is, uh, is, what are some of the best practices to ensure that these principles of design and of causality are really you know, getting through to the students without overwhelming them? The question concerning evaluations, our experience is that it's very difficult to find professionals that have skills in, 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 in evaluations. And what, what we are trying to do when, when we have some of the of, of processions of Mikhail people and so on, we, we, try, we, we find that in some consultancies there are some people that have already done evaluation, but this, those skills are very different from the, the ones that we, they have people in research centers or even in the universities. In, in terms of the, and, it is, and it's not an issue about the, the, the for example, the, the, the quantitative skills needed to do evaluations are the same that they, they are in, in the academia. But there, there, there you, the, the application is very different. So in, in, in research, the, the interest of research are, are basically to have to, to trespass the, the frontiers of knowledge. But in our case, what we want to do is to, to improve, the, improve public policies. No? And, and, and this, this focus is different. And, and the people that, that um, are in the academia, the, they, they, they should know, they should learn a little bit when they come, they should learn about some of the basic things that what is a, the policy cycle, but also what is a, a, a needs evaluation, what is an implementation evaluation, what is a, is a design evaluation. For example, we use a lot the theor theories of change and in, in universities, theories of change are not used that much. So, and so it's, but the, our, experience, our experience shows that, that the people that 
um, they, they come from universe. They are not a specific program here. Here that they 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 teach evaluation, and that is why I was saying that it's very important to have some specific program that that will be training in evaluation, but also the, also the specificities of the evaluation. Um, uh, you, you have to do some training when you are on, 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 on specific organizations. And, and I hope that for, with the, this increase of demand, there will be the more and more um, um, specific places where you could be able to, to learn evaluation. For example, in the UK, there are a lot of different, different kind of organizations that are in the middle between academia and government, like what works initiatives and different uh, what work networks or centers that they, they, they do so summaries of evaluations and so on. And these are the skills that also you learn the, how to do a memo in, in, and to, to add evidence on this. And these are some specific skills that, 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 that should be worked also in training programs. Yeah, if I can add, uh, thank you, Mark. I, for me, the skills are paramount, and probably the real answer to how how much methods should we be training is is you know not enough. Um, that that should be the real answer. But I think that together with methods, at least in my experience, organizations are or should be desperate for criteria on how to use those methods. Um, we had a partnership, we still have actually a partnership uh, at UCL with the Alan Turing Institute in data science, which is one of the top data science institutes in the world, right? So in terms of methods, these are the guys. Uh, and I remember I had a, a joint PhD with them who did some natural language processing to analyze feedback on GPs. So every time that you go to the doctor in the UK, you can fill a survey. And at the end, there is an open question, like you know, comment on your experience. And that's where the real things are. So we apply natural language processing to see which were the main topics, the main things that would make people happier or not, more satisfied or less with their hospitals, with doctors. Um, and at the end, he was very excited with the results. Um, but I remember telling him, if you look at what makes people happy, which is what managers wanted to know, uh, both him and managers were actually aligned here, saying it's great, right, because we have seen that the importance of not waiting more than three hours in the emergency room is pretty much the same as being able to choose your medical doctor. What matters the most is actually whether people is nice to you, treat you nicely or not. But even, you know, you went through pages and pages of analysis, you couldn't find a single time whether that medical doctor had cured your disease or not, whether the treatment was the right one or not. Why is that? Because there is a huge, you know, you will learn this in the program, the principal agent here, there's a huge information asymmetry. I don't know whether this is just a spot or in, you know, two months is going to become a cancer. I don't know that, right? What can I evaluate here? I can evaluate whether my doctor was nice to me, the nurse was smiling, you know, I didn't have to wait too much and the place was clean, among other things. So. Once we learn how to analyze this, we should also have this criteria on, well, what are the things that matter for the service? Because it's certainly not whether the place, you know, whether you have a, one of the other really important things was if parking was easy. Then your policy recommendation to the hospital manager is gonna be, you know, expand the parking lot, train your doctors on how to deal nicely with patients, don't bother on the latest techniques on fighting cancer here, right? That's, that's the main important part. So criteria plus skills. In terms of executive, executive in, in, I mean, there are a few of them that love uh, quant skills or quality skills, for instance. Most of them don't. Most of them, actually, I say, when you train them, the idea is that they should develop a trust relationship with you in which you tell them what the results of the studies are without needing to justify those results methodologically because they trust either the organization that you're teaching within or yourself or the program or hopefully the three of them. And finally, talking about opportunities to develop this with organizations outside universities, I would say here I would, I would, like, to, I would like to encourage you to try to find those opportunities yourself. 
I've had, for example, at UCL, we have something called a dissertation, and a student's complaint that is not a capstone. The difference between a capstone and a dissertation is that a capstone is an applied project with a client organization, a dissertation is an academic paper. But nothing prevents you from doing an academic paper on a transformation project in a real organization. There is nothing written against that. On the contrary, it sounds great. So I would say that I would not wait for my university to provide those opportunities on a silver plate for me. I would try to see which are the organizations that seem interesting for me, that could be appealing for my career, and I would approach them and try to see which are the projects that they're working on and if they would like to do something with me, regardless of whether we have an actual agreement with the organization, with the university in this case or not. But I think, I thought differently when I was a student. Uh, yes, oh, two more, okay. So, I, should I start? Okay. Um, I would like to know your experience with the judiciary. So, we are all thinking that uh, probably, probably in the past, but more in the future, we're going to have illib illiberal uh, politicians, whether from the right or the left. So, we are seeing this Cabify example. So, at the very end is the Court of Justice saying, okay, in Barcelona, we should have Cabify's around, um, and it's not the politicians, so probably against the politicians. And um, so I would like to know to what extent what we were discussing about methods. Uh, in the judiciary, you are going to find people deciding on A or B with contradictory uh, reports from experts. So that's interesting, and there is a room for that in MPP programs. I'm Catalan, I cannot talk about the judiciary system. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a lawyer, so I can talk about the judiciary system. Um, and it, let me, it, let me, it, it, so when I was talking about the construction, the, sort of the history of American public policy, something really, something really distinct um, from my experience in European public policy settings is the way in which the law is treated. Notice I never said anything about the law. I talked about politics. I talked about being in, embedded in political environments, political actors, things like that. But not as, as uh, you know, following the rules, right? Public administration programs actually are quite a bit better at think in the U.S. at thinking about about the law and the effective courts. And it, I, I mean, I was hired by one because I wrote a dissertation on on reform that was happening in the courts, as opposed to reform that was happening in uh, in the legislature. And indeed, because because the courts could take a a claim that they had to. Um, that they had to adjudicate because it was brought to them, they, they could play an interest group against the legislature and get an outcome that neither one of them would have been able to contemplate had they gone to the, to the, uh, um, to the, uh, the legislature. Of course, what I'm saying is a long tradition in um, my country, in American constitutional law, the sort of famous Caroline products footnote four, suggests that groups that lose in the legislature could come to the court and win. That's, that's, a, bit of a, newer, um, that's a bit of a newer phenomenon in, in some European law discussions, but it's one, that, it's one that certainly exists nonetheless. I do think that we, we need to talk more about the law as opposed to as opposed to less in these kinds of programs. When you talk about when you talk about uh, um, it, you know what do you pack into this two year program? I do think there is some sense in which, um, and I've done it through this sort of concept of of responsibility and normative analysis. You know, your, your, uh, the rules say this, what is your responsibility? Um, sometimes your, 
your, uh, if you stay in your position, your responsibility is to the rules. And sometimes those rules change, such as when a court decision comes from the middle of nowhere to, to change the way something operates. But all that, it's, it's not a great answer, but if we're studying institutions and we spend a lot of time talking about legislatures, executives, and decentralized um, organization or, or, or institutions, we talk about supranational organizations, we should be talking about the, uh, about the courts as well. Yeah, can I add a thought yeah, yeah, yeah. on just, be, be, yeah, behind my initial joke, not so much a joke. Um, I think we've seen, I was mentioning that public policy has left, uh, has started to leave uh, the government and going to corporate world. And, and you know, that's, that's great for us. But I think we also should fight to somehow keep in the future public policy within government, or at least an important part of it within government. Because as we will see, once we start competing with the corporate wall, once our students start having choices between the corporate wall and government, we might discover, as we have in, in other fields, that, that it's very difficult for government to attract them. And, and you know, we will find the top ones on, on the other side of the table when we have to negotiate with them, for example. So I would, I would be I'm worried about that. Or well, I think we should worry about that in the future. Um, and then I would say that also when it comes to the judiciary system, we should try to motivate our policymakers, our students, policymakers to be. Because the, the best way to ensure that you have no issues with the judiciary system is not doing much. If you don't do much as a policymaker, you know that you're not going to have an issue. Once you start doing things, then, well, in some cases, because you know it's not that you want to do something illegal, but it's true that in some cases the laws are difficult to interpret, and you might find yourself that you know being too entrepreneurial would lead to issues with the judiciary system. So I, I would, and this obviously on the long term, the rational approach to this would be: it's better not to do much. Also, because if you do a lot and you're successful. In the way that the public sector works, it's not going to have a strong impact on your career development. Because it's also even difficult to measure whether you have been a great manager or not. Think about who was your favorite health minister of your country. Who was your favorite? You probably know which ones you didn't like. But who was the best one and why? It's probably more difficult. Education minister, the general secretary for, you know, which are the top policy makers that you like and why? You probably... You probably have people that you quite like because you've seen them on, on TV and they speak well. Um, but what is the exact actions policies that they have implemented and how that you think make them very good? That's, you have usually very little information about that. And we like public policy. Imagine you know, the society at large. So I think we should try to push uh, our policymakers to keep doing things, uh, hopefully within the boundaries of the judiciary system, but also pushing them I want to quickly support one other thing that you mentioned. This issue of graduates going to the private sector and to high paying jobs there, that, that's a significant problem and has been in, in the U.S. It's certainly since the time I was a, I was a, a Ph.D. student um, in the, oh God, late 1990s. <laughs> and it, it, Princeton University lost some of its, uh, its greatest funding um, because of this sort of disconnect between where the what the funding was supposed to be training people for and where the students were, were going. Um, my wife has a public policy degree and she is a management consultant that works with drug companies. So there that we do train them with skills. You know, when you think about the things that we train them with, we give them skills that, you know, if you squint, it looks a bit like an MBA, right? And, and uh, indeed, we find that, particularly at NYU, we would find, and USC to a lesser extent, but NYU to a huge extent, the students would, they wouldn't get into the Stern School, so they would come to us. And where were their, where were their ambitions? Their ambitions were to go back to their countries and 
do the jobs they would have with an MBA. So that's a, that's a real issue that, that continues. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm Emmanuel Mathieu, I'm a senior research fellow uh, here at eBay. Um, I would like to have your opinion about the opportunities but also the challenges of using simulations for teaching public policy and perhaps if you have in mind examples uh, or initiatives that go into this direction. can say one quick thing, Emmanuel. Um, they're, they're absolutely great. They're hard to pull off, but Elizabeth Gerber at the University of Michigan has created a startup around, uh, around a, uh, um, a simulation, a simulation you can, you can implement in your classes and across classes that, uh, I mean, it's modeled on American politics, but you can see the there's been so much uptake that she basically has a, a business around around the thing. So, so I think they're I think they're great. I I would also suggest there is a journal called I think it's called Public Administration Teaching and Education Learning. You you will know this better than I, Tony. Learning. What is it the Journal of Public J P A E? Okay. Journal of Public Affairs Education. Okay. Oh, that's what it that's is. A, okay. That's the one. That's the one. So this one has several uh, articles explaining simulations, if, if you want. I personally don't use much simulations. I prefer to use case studies. I was trained in business school, so you know, it's, a, it's a personal bias, but, but you have plenty of them. And if you are interested in case studies, most of them are in a web page called thecasecenter.org, which is also very helpful. There are hundreds and hundreds of them. I think we have the last one here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh. Okay, yeah. So I would like to comment about one aspect that was um, in this table and that I find it uh, crucial, which is what role causal inference has in this. Because one thing is quantitative skills and another thing is causal inference. I think causal inference requ requires a discipline requires a lot of time, requires to differentiate key different traditions. There is one tradition in quantitative analysis of doing a lot of regressions with a lot of variables and so on. There is another tradition that it's more in evaluation. And if you do a, a little bit of this and a little bit of that, I think that there is a little bit of inconsistency sometimes in, in some training. I've, I've been at teaching in, the, in some places. And in one of these subjects, I asked the students to use data to see what came out of that. And they make causal claims with descriptive data, which is pretty much something that happens. And I think that one key decision is how hard you want to go against that from the very beginning and, and, and how much you want to push on that from because for me, many conclusions were directly wrong. They were using data, but the conclusions were not accurate. And that's because of a lack of training in causal inference, in my opinion. So that's my general idea. And I'd like to know what, what's your opinion or your thoughts on that. Yeah. I, can, I can certainly say something about that, too. <laughs> um, so. It's not as though causal inference is a new thing. When I was trained in the 1990s, as I said, Jim Heckman was teaching us that the problem of causal inference was one that came from problems of regression assumptions. There was selection bias. There was omitted variable bias. It's not all of a sudden we create a new, you know, the, the Rubin causal model, and now we're thinking about causal inference when we weren't before. I think that I think that causal inference, um, however, has to be something that MPP students understand. Because remember what MPP students are doing, right? If you're a, if you're an analyst, you're pooling some things together. Maybe you're working in a in a in a larger group, 
right? So somebody there needs to, needs to know how to design studies, design experiments, do these kinds of things. Not necessarily you on the ground, and not necessarily you without a PhD or without other, other kinds of training. But what you do have to know is how to consume that research. And so you do have to know the difference between a, between an, um, a, a descriptive study and a, and a study that has a claim to causality. And you also have to know the kinds of things that, that we really try to stress. When is observational better, data better than randomized control trials? These kind of things. What can you, what can you learn from these different types of, of, uh, of data? There, there are, these, are, these are really challenging kind of things. So what I'm, what I'm saying is I think you should encourage, like the curriculum has to encourage the students to d see these different styles of evidence, right? There are certain things that you can't learn through a survey question. There are certain things you can't learn through a survey experiment. And sometimes it's important just to go in and talk to people so that you can figure out how, how that's going on. So, so qualitative research has this intensely important place in the methods training in a, in a, in a public policy program, I think, as well. Um, one thing that Mark said before, and I think this is, this is actually... Um, is actually quite important to, to think about when you, it, just what you can do in public policy programs. So methods training is hard, it's rig rigorous, it makes you think about how to use data. R is free and so are MOOCs. And we often spend a whole lot of time and students' tuition dollars on training them up in R, in the classroom, through labs and things like this, where we could, we could marshal these other kinds of resources out there to help them be more advanced and be able to consume the kinds of lessons that you're rightly suggesting that they, they, be, able to, they be able to do. And I think the same goes for chat G GPT. You know, if it can write some code and they can debug it, they can move a lot faster than, you know, here's what a data frame is, right? These kinds of things. And again, paying tuition to have someone like me teach them what a data frame is, is really a, is, it, that, that it, I, have, I have ethical considerations there. It's quite expensive for me to do something that you can get in a very well-designed sort of free format. And I think now in this world of lots of information, particularly about methods and methods training, we have to work within those, those um, uh, with what we've got. We, we do try, but uh, um, we also run out of time, and <laughs> run out of resources, and those kinds of things as well. So it's, it's just something to constantly keep in mind, I think. In, also, in, in the field of evaluation, what I think it is important that uh, a student of a Master of Public Policy Design knows is not to, to do the evaluations, but is to, to know um, what the different kind of evaluations are helping to the different programs, so this is important to, to know. And also to be able to, to formulate good questions, good evaluation questions, and then the, the, the professionals of evaluation that they, they do that, there will be the ones that will do the evaluation. But it's important to, to have a broad view of the, of the different um, questions that the evaluation could help him in, in the order of the, the, in the decision making process. And also in terms of that, of data, what are the, the problems in, in, in the, that they could have in, in order in the different data and, and how to make, to, to deal with, 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 with this. But not necessarily to, to analyze data and collect data, but what, what could be the problem that they could have and on how how they will be able to, to, to solve it. Just to finish, I, I fully agree with your point. It's a very good point. I think that it's also kind of an important in the realm of all the other things that are happening in public policy in the sense that the day that this becomes the main issue, it will be really good news because it will mean that we have fixed all the others that we have. 
So it's important, but I think that we still have a lot to do before focusing on these issues that, that, that difficult causal claims, you know, I'm not sure if I'm making myself clear. Like, it, it's true, absolutely true, but, but we have a lot of work to do to reach this point, I guess. Yeah. Good, thank you. I think we need to close the table. Just let me throw you the last, last question, very brief. Uh, if, um, so, what are the skills, uh, we've talked about the skills a lot, but if I just ask you to give me two, three skills that we really need to be sure our students acquire in this new masters, uh, that really relates to what's needed in the real world, what do you think should be? Like, very brief. <laughs> <laughs> For me, analysis and argument. For me, evaluation and evaluation. <laughs> but I'm very biased. So, for me, it should be criteria, policy criteria, yeah. Uh, good. So thank you very much for participating in the roundtable. It was very, very interesting. And thank you all for uh, contributing to the debate. And I think we can close here. I don't know if Justin, you want to say something? Done? Okay. Uh, anyone else? No? Okay.